Director, International Affairs, American Insurance Association, Washington, D.C. Welcome, Mr. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Chairman Williamson and members of the Commission. My name is Stephen Simchak, and uh, on behalf of the American Insurance Association, I am honored to offer this testimony to the U.S. International Trade Commission. AIA is the leading property casualty insurance trade organization in the U.S., representing approximately 300 major U.S. insurance companies that provide all lines of property casualty insurance to consumers and businesses in the United States and around the world. We appreciate greatly the ITC's undertaking this investigation into trade, investment, and industrial policies in India and their effects on the U.S. economy. The ITC has been a leader in highlighting the impact on the U.S. economy of barriers to trade and investment in the property casualty insurance sector, notably in its 2009 investigation, Property and Casualty Insurance Services, Competitive Conditions in Foreign Markets. It was in that investigation that the ITC concluded that U.S. exports would increase by 48% or $870 million if all the examined countries were to fully liberalize cross-border property casualty insurance exports, and that U.S.-owned affiliates could increase sales by 28%, or $39.1 billion, if all examined countries fully liberalized affiliate sales restrictions. That liberalization, the ITC concluded, would lead to significant job growth here in the U.S., and those jobs would pay above average wages. The ITC's analysis made it clear that such barriers from any of our trading partners cost the U.S. valuable jobs, and India is not an exception. Those jobs come from cross-border exports and in U.S.-based staff that support the operations of affiliates established abroad. Though many jobs have to be located in the country where the business is being performed, sales agents for instance, when a U.S. headquartered insurance company expands abroad, it will generally perform many services related to its management of the foreign affiliate from its U.S. headquarters. So, as the ITC found, if there were more U.S. invested insurance companies in India, those companies would create employment in India and here in the U.S. alike. Investigations such as this will, keep, uh, will help keep these issues at the forefront of the global economic agenda of policymakers. And we look forward to working with the ITC's economists and other staff and building upon the foundations laid in that report to create an accurate picture of the costs associated with certain trade and investment barriers in India. To give you a sense of why U.S. insurers want to enter the Indian market, economic growth and demand for insurance go hand in hand. When government red tape is cleared away, private insurers are ready to meet that demand. Since opening in 1999, India's insurance market has seen strong growth. However, India remains underinsured. For instance, the World Economic Forum ranks India 52nd out of 62 surveyed nations in property casualty insurance penetration. While low insurance penetration and density present opportunities for newcomers to the market, the lack of insurance poses dangers to the overall soundness of the economy. Economic and social stability in any country are directly related to the uptake of insurance in that country. Insurance also guarantees that a bad harvest, isolated acts of stupidity from an employee, automobile accidents, or other unexpected events will not bankrupt a company or push a family into economic ruin. With proper insurance, you're no longer one disaster away from destitution. Thankfully, India's government has recognized that the economy is underinsured and made expansion of insurance coverage a public policy goal of the country's 12th five-year plan. However, 14 years after the opening of the Indian insurance market, barriers in India keep U.S. insurance trade and investment below its potential. The ITC recognized this situation in its 2009 investigation that I mentioned earlier when it ranked India among the bottom third of the most restrictive countries in its innovative insurance trade restrictiveness index. That put India just ahead of Brazil, Argentina, China, Venezuela, and others. The most significant and most obvious barrier to investment is the cap on foreign direct investment in insurance companies in India. The equity cap has undoubtedly discouraged U.S. insurers from entering the Indian market and could explain why several foreign insurers, including U.S. insurers, have recently pulled out of India. Currently, that cap stands at 26%, one of the most protectionist in the region. As a result, all foreign insurers that establish in India are forced to find a joint venture partner or partners to make up the remaining 74% of investment. For illustrative purposes, China, Korea, Taiwan, and Mexico permit 100% of foreign ownership of property casualty insurance companies. Even Malaysia and the Philippines permit more than 50% foreign ownership. Furthermore, within India's financial sector, the insurance cap is one of the lowest when compared with other financial products. 
The government of India first announced that it intended to raise the cap to 49% in 2004, but a decade later it remains at 26%. A bill amending the insurance law that raised the cap to 49% remains under consideration in the Indian parliament, and the increase is supported by the Congress party-led government of India. Unfortunately, due to domestic political reasons, the opposition party has stalled its consideration. While even a 49% FDI cap would be a significant investment barrier, it would undeniably be a step in the right direction and would be to the benefit of insurers and consumers alike. Increasing the FDI cap in insurance would quickly provide a significant and long-term injection of foreign investment into the Indian economy. A large part of this investment would be from US and other foreign companies increasing their stakes in their existing joint ventures. Furthermore, expanding coverage in India will undoubtedly require more capital. Companies will need capital to write more policies, expand distribution networks, train and hire talent that must be in country, and perhaps most importantly, to meet the solvency requirements that are essential to the integrity of the financial system. Furthermore, a 49% cap, FDI cap in the industry would attract new market entrants over time. There are large US insurance companies that would like to enter the Indian market for the reasons I outlined earlier, but are hesitant to do so until the FDI cap is raised or eliminated. Even those that do want to enter the market at 26% FDI can have difficulty finding a suitable joint venture partner from outside the insurance industry, and from a minority ownership position, they can face challenges implementing the types of corporate governance policies that are considered the bedrock of industry best practices. In recent sessions of the Indian Parliament, it has been suggested that a compromise could be struck to have the equity increase come from foreign institutional investment, FII, rather than FDI. If this were to occur, it would not be viewed favorably by U.S. insurers and would not constitute the breaking down of an investment barrier. An equity increase through FII would reward speculative investors and would discriminate against serious, long-term FDI investors like insurance companies. Furthermore, FII would not create the kind of economic growth in the U.S. that an FDI increase would. Addressing another issue, U.S. insurance CEOs understandably place a high level of importance on so-called regulatory predictability and regulatory transparency <coughs> in any market they are considering. We support sound regulation, but we feel that it is vital that regulators minimize unnecessary barriers to free enterprise while achieving the necessary level of protection. This applies to changes in existing regulations as well as approvals for new products, which can frequently take an extremely long period of time in India. In my testimony, I've described a series of life insurance regulations that were introduced without consultation, without an impact study, and without adequate new product approvals to fill a void in the market the regulations created. The impact of those changes was astounding. In 2012, life insurance premiums made up only 3.19% of GDP, down from 4.6% in 2009, constituting a 31% drop in its portion of GDP. I want to make it clear that the government of India took these measures for a very important reason, that of consumer protection. But consultation with industry would have undoubtedly led to more effective and less injurious regulations, and at the very least would have permitted insurers to adjust their practices in anticipation of the changes. I've also outlined other significant barriers to trade and investment in my written testimony, which in the interest of time I will not discuss this morning. While I have not intended to paint an overly negative picture of U.S. insurance trade and investment with India, there are clearly challenges that should be overcome in the market. Those challenges beg the question of what can be done to alleviate them. In the case of the FDI cap, unfortunately our options are somewhat limited, since the delay in passing the legislation is the result of a domestic political impasse. However, there are some actions that the U.S. is taking and should continue to take to encourage the FDI cap increase and address other significant trade and investment barriers. In all such actions, we need to remember that India will only act on the FDI cap if it is demonstrated to be in the interests of India. Trade and investment negotiations based on reciprocity are one important opportunity to do so. To that end, we hope that both sides will re-energize the U.S.-India bilateral investment treaty negotiations as soon as possible. The U.S. should make it clear that we expect a bid with India to be high standard and embrace national treatment in it, including raising the FDI cap in insurance. While it does not have the same binding legal power of a ratified treaty like a BIT, the U.S.-India Trade Policy Forum should also be a priority. U.S. business is very lucky that the U.S. has some of the most skilled economic diplomats in the world at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, the Department of Commerce, and the State Department. 
They should continue to reach out to state level and opposition party leaders in order to develop relationships with potential future leaders, as well as with the ruling party at the national level. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I've gone into more depth on all these points in my written testimony, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.